Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dmitry Balkovsky of the Reactionary Blog uh, with uh, issue number three. In this blog, I will talk about a project we are doing with a group of colleagues and about history. History and the questions it may help answer for us today. Uh, first of all, about the project, it concerns the migration of uh, farmers of European descent from South Africa into Russia, uh, you may have probably heard that uh, the government of South Africa is uh, actively persecuting uh, farmers of European descent. Uh, the black majority government is uh, trying to take away their land their property and their businesses, and uh, several uh, dozens of people have been murdered already. So the situation is quite desperate and it is developing on the Zimbabwean model, it appears to me. Uh, it looks like uh, Boer farmers are thinking the unthinkable right now. They may be forced to pick up and go and leave everything uh, they have worked for uh, generation after generation, uh, leave their lands and businesses and uh, family estates. So they're searching for a new home and as strange as it may sound to some, uh, Russia could become one of their potential destinations uh, last year in 2018 they have already visited uh, Stavropol which is a uh, southern Russian region famous for its agriculture it is a Russian breadbasket and they have orchards and cattle and all things agricultural so it is a uh, very very interesting place for them probably to settle and it is similar in climate too with uh, with the very with the southern tip of Africa. Russia at the moment is living through agricultural renaissance uh, there is a uh, special state program helping uh, qualified foreigners to obtain citizenship the um, income tax is very low it's 13 percent for uh, physical persons Plus, uh, there are special land cultivation and uh, uh, invigoration programs in the Far East, and some other measures. Uh, Russia is taking active steps about uh, reviving its village life, its country life. So, uh, it, is a, it is a very opportune moment for farmers, South African farmers or any other qualified uh, agricultural experts to uh, try their luck in Russia and Russia has a long history of migrations too for example in the 18th century uh, Catherine the Great uh, the Empress being herself a German princess invited uh, some of her country mates to Russia uh, specifically uh, religious minorities who were persecuted uh, in uh, Central Europe at the time so the Germans came and they settled and uh, they were very successful. They settled along the uh, low regions of Volga River. There were separate settlements. They had uh, tax exemptions and conscription exemptions. So it, it was uh, it was a long-term successful experiment. Then the Bolsheviks came to power, and it all went sour, really. But. Uh, for 150 years, Germans were part of Russian life. Not only Germans, by the way, there were Greeks and Italians in the south. There is a, even a special ethnicity, so-called Russian Germans. Uh, there are three million of them at the moment. The majority of them moved back to Germany, but there are several hundred thousands living in Russia and Kazakhstan still. At this very moment, uh, as I said, uh, our action committee a group of like-minded colleagues are talking to a regional government in the center of European Russia, in the east, and uh, they appear to be quite interested because this is very uh, 
popular topic right now. We'll see how it develops, but uh, we are looking to have as many qualified people in the Russian countryside as, as we can. I think it's very, very promising, and uh, we're inviting everyone uh, to enter the discussion. If you, ladies and gents, have any proposals, interesting thoughts, please share them with us. And I provided my uh, email address in, this in the description, so please do talk to us and tell us what you think. And now, my dear fellow paleo-conservatives and paleo-libertarians, let me uh, talk to you about history. And uh, first of all, as an opening statement, I'd like to say that uh, we really do live in difficult, uh, confusing, hazy times, even. Times without precedent in the sense that we really have lost the direction Christendom is dead and gone. Europe and uh, all former Christian countries are being swamped by uh, uh, hostile foreigners. Not all of them bad. No, not, not all. But uh, quite a few of them are really not willing to assimilate. And there is really nothing to assimilate to. That's, that's not a problem. So we did lose the direction. Traditional conservatives are marginalized, the libertarians are marginalized, we are looked at as uh, crazy types, uh, dreamers, or the fringe. <laughs> so there is nothing really but progressivism left. There is a rabid uh, Maxine Waters variety, if we are talking about the United States, or there is Fox News. It is slightly more right-leaning progressivism as well. Uh, conservatism is dead in our world. Russia remains culturally conservative in many ways, but uh, economically it is as progressive as, as they come. So there is not really much difference, unfortunately, philosophically. So what do we do now? Uh, I believe that we have to look at the past, uh, rediscover our roots, see what our ancestors did, which allowed them to prosper and thrive in ways which are not really um, available to us today, that are lost. And when conservatives and libertarians are talking about the past, their ideal past is the period before the World War I, the period of uh, gold standard and uh, continuous prosperity, the rise of standard of living, but I myself have um, a favorite past of my own, a remote historical period called the Late Antiquity, from the 3rd century AD to the 7th century AD, and at the time, at that remote, long gone time, Christendom was born, our civilization and everything that we loved and cherished for centuries and I love and admire this period of history. For, for, for a long time I've been uh, reading up on this uh, since my days at uh, Moscow Institute for History and Archives because I'm a historian, my first degree is in history. So I, I really want to share with you my love of this period uh, it had larger-than-life personalities, all the great emperors, great saints, bishops, uh, scholars, uh, statesmen, soldiers. Uh, it was an age of hard money and economic prosperity, too. It was an age of mm, capitalism at its best, really. Uh, uh, free markets. So, over the past uh, several years, I gathered... Uh, a small library of works on this period in English, because I used to read about it in Russian, but uh, there is much, way more uh, about it in English. So Amazon helped me a lot with it. So I did did buy a lot of books, about a hundred, and uh, right now I'm in the process of reading them. So uh, it is really, 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 it was fascinating time. And I believe there are answers to be found there, and this time is completely forgotten. 
completely forgotten. Just uh, we remember ancient Greeks, and then we go over straight to the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and uh, the time in between, the time of greatness, really, is just uh, somehow escapes us. Uh, the first book I'd like to present to you in this small volume by Peter Brown, a history professor from Princeton University. It was published in 1971, and it's called uh, The World of Late Antiquity. It's been republished uh, several times. Uh, Professor Brown was the one who coined the term Late Antiquity. He invented it. So, my dear fellow conservatives and libertarians, there are good humanities professors too, professors of classics. Uh, there is a really high level of scholarship right now, in this very moment. Excellent books coming out. Very small uh, circulation, several hundred copies, maybe two, three, four thousand, no more than that. It, it is all happening along with uh, eco-feminism and gender studies. So, um, there is something to be proud of about Western universities still, this is a good sign. Uh, so, uh, why did I uh, pick this book? Well, it's small, it is a good start, it is well illustrated, so it is kind of a good uh, place to, good start to test yourself, because if you don't like the topic, you will probably just uh, read it and leave it aside. But if you do, uh, there is a lot, uh, way more to explore. So what does this book talk about? Well, it talks about the late antiquity. And first of all, it debunks the idea that Rome fell in 476. This idea uh, originates with Edward Gibbon, the great uh, British historian of the 18th century. You can often read about it, uh, about the fall of Rome, uh, in libertarian blogs. Uh, bloggers like to compare modern America to ancient Rome. Uh, they talk a lot about inflation. Yes, there was inflation in the 3rd century, but then the, in the 4th century the situation changed completely. There was no age of decadence and decay. The empire was thriving. It was... Um, militarily successful and politically and economically successful under Constantine and his uh, descendants uh, up to 378 when uh, there was military disaster at Adrianople when uh, Eastern Roman Emperor Valens was uh, killed in battle with Goths. Uh, but before that uh, Rome was getting along quite nicely, and it continued to get along nicely, but in the East. Uh, the Western half of the empire did fall apart in the 5th century and uh, disappeared, but the East uh, continued to live and thrive in every way, economically, politically, militarily, culturally, religiously, for another thousand years. So it is really not true to say that Rome fell in 476. It continued to live for a very, very long time. And uh, unfortunately, in the modern West, uh, this Eastern Roman Empire, which was uh, named Byzantine by Renaissance scholars, is completely forgotten. But there is a lot to learn from there, a lot, really. A funny factoid about the fall of Rome, this uh, alleged full of Rome, is the contemporaries did not even notice that Rome fell in 476. Uh, this event was first noticed a thousand years after in Renaissance Italy, but before that people did not know, so it's just a little thing like that that changes your view of things, really. The book is easy to read, it's not too uh, heavy, but it is a proper academic work with the bibliography and index. And that's the way I like it. I like proper scholarly works. Uh, some of them are well written and some of them are a bit heavy. But this one is uh, relatively easy, so I uh, do recommend this in this regard as well. Uh, there are some bits that I found dubious in what Professor says. For example, he's calling monks, and he talks a lot about monks and monasteries in his uh, book. Price fighters against the devil. Well, I would say that they were first of all uh, 
lovers of God and lovers of, of their fellow men, of their neighbor, uh, be they uh, Christians or pagans, and there were a lot of pagans still at the time. So that can be argued with. But other than that, I do enjoy it and recommend it. And I also uh, really would want to ask you to buy it in paper format because I believe as conservatives we should try and keep the book reading culture alive. It's very important. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your likes and dislikes if you don't like it. And subscriptions too is important. Uh, write to us if you have questions. Drop by for a cup of coffee. If you're ever in Moscow, we are in the very middle of Moscow. Easy to find. Uh, thanks for watching.